Eighth grade math, test 13, study guide. Problem number one says, which range contains the value of the square root of 30 plus 7 minus 10? And these are in parentheses here, but it's the same thing. And so what we do is we want to simplify that radicand, simplify that number inside the square root. So if I take 30 plus 7 minus 10, if I do the rule for subtraction, that's plus negative 10. And then if I just use James, I can see that... Uh, uh, 30 positives and 7 positives is a total of 37 positives. I have 10 negatives. Opposite teams mean subtract. 37 take away 10 is 27. There are more positives than negatives. That's why this is a positive answer. And we have the square root of 27. And we try got to try to find out what to uh, what number that's closest to. Uh, actually, it's a range of numbers um, to the nearest tenth. So we're going to kind of estimate rad 27. So I look at the perfect squares that, rat, that 27 is in between. 5 times 5 is 25. 6 times 6 is 36. 5 and 6 are consecutive. 27 is in between those two perfect squares. So the square root of 27 is in between these two perfect squares. The square root of 25 is 5. The square root of 36 is 6, which means the square root of 27 is 5 point something. And right there, that's enough to answer the question. It's B. But if we had to estimate it even closer, we can see that... Um, the square root of 27 is closer to 25 than 36, so it's kind of on the smaller end. So when you get these problems, if it's closer to the smaller number, it's going to be like, you know, 5.1 to 5.3, around there. It's possible it could be 5.0. It could round down, right? If it's about in the middle, it's going to be in this range here, right? And if it's closer to the larger number, it's going to be in that range. So this one had to be, the answer was B. Number two says, give the values for the numeric expressions. So we have 7 over 10. Well, if you read that, that's 7 tenths, so that one was pretty easy. Or you could just divide in and out and get 0.7. Rad 16 over 5, the square root of 16 is equal to 4. So 4 divided by 5, again, you go in and out. 4 goes in, 5 goes out, you should get 0.8. And for the last one, uh, pi divided by 4. Pi is about 3.14, so we have 3.14 divided by 4. Remember, it goes in and out. So I put my decimal up top, and 4 cannot go into 3, so I put a 0 here. 4 does go into 31, so this is where my first number goes, right here. So go ahead, and I'll go off to the side and do your division. Pause the video. Make sure you get what I got. If not, find your mistake. Number 3 says, enter the value for x. So we're going to enter the value for x. Well, this is where I'm multiplying powers with the same base, so I copy the base and add the exponent. So in other, in other words, this question is asking us, 3 plus what is 21? Well, I can solve that equation. In other words, take 21, subtract 3, and I know that x has to be 18. 3 plus 18 is 21. 4 says we're going to evaluate this expression if a is negative 4 and b is negative 4. Well, b to the 0 power is just 1, so you can cross out your 1. So we're just worried about the a to the negative second power. So I got negative 4 in parentheses. Make sure that when you're plugging a number into an expression and there's a negative sign, put parentheses because that does change your answer half the time. So first of all, to the negative second power means flip it upside down and it becomes positive second power, but that doesn't affect that negative coefficient. That's a negative one. This means flip me upside down, okay? So we took care of that negative. Now we have to deal with this negative. Since there's two of them, that becomes a positive answer. Now if that was a three, it would be a negative answer. So that's why those parentheses matter. Number five says this. A container holds three to the fifth grains of sand. If there are three to the eighth grains of sand in your backyard, how many containers do you need to store? Well, what we're doing is we're taking the larger number dividing by the smaller number. So we put the larger number on top. Again, this is division. A division means copy the base, subtract the exponents. So I go 13, 8 minus 3 is, uh, excuse me, 8 minus 5 is 3. So I got 13 to the 3 power containers. Number six says, decide which expression below is equivalent to that expression that they gave us. So there's a couple ways to do this. The easiest way is just to go inside. Since they're the same base, we can just copy the base and add the exponent. Negative 15 plus 3 is negative 2. And then there's that negative 2 on the outside. So when we're multiplying powers of the same base, we copy the base and add the exponent. Now this part's different. We're not adding the exponents here. This is where I have power 
next to a power or a power of power that's called. So that's where I copy the base and I multiply. Negative times negative is positive. And then to simplify that, 4 to the 4th means 16 times 16, which is 256. And the answers that that worked for are um, expressions 1 and 4. Okay, expression 1, I have 4 to the 20th times 4 to the negative 16th. Well, 20 plus negative 16 is 4. That's 4 to the 4th. Number 2 doesn't work because that would be 4 to the 2nd. 3 doesn't work because 4 to the 4th is not 16. It's 256. And 4 works, so that's the answer. Number 7 says... How many times larger is 4 times 10 to the 3rd? Uh, how many times larger than 4 times 10 to the 3rd is 8 times 10 to the 12? So I put the bigger number on top. I know it's bigger because of the 12, not because of the 8. So you're looking at the exponents to decide what's bigger. So 8 divided by 4 is 2. And then 10 to the 12 minus 3 is 9. That many times bigger. 8, we're solving the equation. 6 sevenths times some number equals 3 fourteenths. What's that number? So we're going to isolate w. I've got to get rid of that 6 sevenths. When there's a fraction in front of a uh, variable, we can get rid of it by multiplying by the reciprocal. That's the multiplicative inverse. It makes that become a 1. If it's become a 1, it's gone. So I flip this number upside down, not this one, and I multiply both sides by that number. Multiplying by, well, that makes these cross out right here. And so in, a, in order to multiply fractions here, I use the factor trees, right? 14 is uh, 2 times 7. 6 is 2 times 3. The other numbers are prime. Cross out your 1s. You see there's a 7 on top and bottom. There's a 3 on top and bottom. But remember, if these numbers are on the bottom, they've got to stay on the bottom, which means you've got to put a 1 on top. So the answer is W has to be 1 fourth. 6 sevenths times 1 fourth is 3 fourteenths. Number 9 says 8.1 times p equals negative 56 and 7 tenths. So we're going to find what number p is. We're going to find that missing value for the variable. So I divide both sides by the coefficient, which is what I did up here. But dividing my fractions is hard. So another way to divide is multiply by the reciprocal. It's the same as dividing. But since this is a decimal, it's easier to do it this way than trying to multiply by reciprocal. So I draw a line under both sides. I put 8.1. That crosses that out. See the 1 there? I cross out my 1, and when I divide negative 56 and 7 tenths by 8 and 1 tenths, it has to go in and out. The top goes in, bottom goes out. Remember, when you're dividing decimals, you need to clear the decimal for the divisor, the number on the outside. But if you move it, however many times you move it, you've got to move this one the same number of times. If there were no decimals here, we wouldn't bother moving anything. We'd just bring the decimal straight up top. But since I moved it, it's here now, so I've got to bring it up top. 81 doesn't go into 5 or 56, it does go into 567. That's why your first number has to go here. So then I check to see about how many times. I find out it's 7 times. 81 times 7 is 567. And so my answer is 7, except I have negative divided by positive. Check your signs. Use Mr. Dude for that, right? Negative divided by positive is negative. P equals negative 7. Number 10 says, solve z divided by 9 plus 5 equals 10. What number can I divide by 9 and then add 5 and still get 10? Well, I'm going to solve this. Remember, you work farthest away from the variable before you try to ice, uh, before you try to, uh, at, while you're isolating the variable, sorry. Um, and that's just assuming that you've already distributed, combined like terms, got your variables on the same side. All those steps, steps 1 and 2, are done for us. This is step 3. This is a two-step equation. There's one letter and two numbers to get rid of. <coughs> so that's step 3, right? We're all the way down to step 3 isolate the variable. So I work farthest away from the variable first. Steps 2 and 3 is where I do inverse operations. So the positive 5, I subtract 5. So on the left side, it's gone. Because remember, my goal is I'm trying to get z by itself, right? And z over 9 means divide. What's the opposite of divide? I multiply. So I multiply both sides by whatever's on the bottom. If you have a letter on top, variable on top, number on the bottom, multiply by that number, and those will cross out. But you've got to multiply this by the same thing. 5 times 9 is 45. The answer is 45. 45 divided by 9 is 5. 5 plus 5 is 10. 45 makes this true. 45 is the solution. We're on number 11 now. Problem number 11. So we're solving this equation. And for number 11, 
Step one is done for us. Both sides are simplified. So we're on step two, get our variables on one side. Now remember, when you have letters on both sides, get your letters together before you get your constants. You could still get the right answer, but you can run into some problems if you don't do it in that order. So let's get our letters together first. But before I do that, I'm going to do the rule for subtraction, right? If I have any subtraction, just make it addition. It makes things easier. We can use teams then. Now I'm going to get my letters on one side. I don't want X's on both sides, so I'm going to get rid of that. This is step two. In step two, we don't divide. We don't divide until the very end. Step two, we add or subtract. So since it's a negative 12, I'm going to add 12, right? I don't look at that. I look at what's in front of the 12. I take the X with it because I don't want X's on both sides. So look what I did. I got rid of X on the left side. Now there's just a 54 by adding 12X. But I have to do it over here too. I have negative 3, positive 12. I use teams. There's more positives than negative. Opposite teams, we subtract. Now it's a two-step equation. Now we're on step three, isolate the variable. So we work farthest away from the variable. So I don't do the X now. I go over here to the negative 63. I add 63 to both sides. 54 plus 63 is 117. And that crosses out and I have 9X. So I divide both sides by 9. Check your sub uh, division over there. Make sure you go off to the side and do that. And you should get 13. 13, if I put 13 here and here, both of these will be the same number. It'll be a true equation. This is the solution. 12, we're solving another equation. It's a multi-step equation. So, again, we simplify both sides first. Then we get our variables on both sides like we did here. Then we isolate like we did a couple equations ago. So, simplifying both sides means distribute first if you can. So I go 1 third times 9x. That means 9x divided by 3. Okay? And then 1 third times negative 15. But I have a subtraction problem here. So I'm going to do the rule for subtraction first, right? I'm going to draw two sticks. So I make my minus into plus, and then I change the sign for positive 15, which is negative 15. If it was minus negative, I would make it into positive. So we draw two sticks. So one-third of 9x, when I distribute one-third, it's like dividing by 3. One-third of 9x is 3x. One-third of negative 15. 15 divided by 3 is 5. Positive divided by negative is negative. And then look, I copy everything else down. 2x equals 70. We're simplifying both sides, step one. What do we do? Distribute, combine like terms. So we have like terms. X's are like terms with X's. So I'm still on step one, so I don't do any inverse operations here. I just combine my like terms. 3X and 2X equals 5X. Now I'm on step three. I simplified both sides. I got my variables on one side. Actually, that was done for me. Step two was done for me, right? Here I had to do step two. Here it's done for me because I don't have any x's over here. So I go to step three. I work farthest away from the variable first. Now I start doing opposite or inverse operations. So now if it's negative, I do positive, right? We're on the same side. I don't do that. When I'm on the same side, I just combine them the way they are. But when I'm on step three, I start doing steps two and three. I start doing opposite operations. So I add five to both sides. 5x equals 75 means I divide both sides by 5, and my answer is 15. 15, if I put 15 here and here, this side will equal 70. It'll be a true equation. Problem number 13 says, how many solutions do these have? Okay, so let's look at these one at a time. If you guys are solving an equation like we did earlier, and there's only one x, there's going to be one answer. We're going to isolate the variable, there's going to be one answer. So if you have one X just on one side after simplifying both sides, after doing step one, there's always going to be one answer. Now, if we simplify both sides and we see that there's letters or variables on both sides, then most likely there's going to be one answer, but sometimes there's special cases. Sometimes there's infinite number of answers, and that means everything's an answer, right? And that's when we have the same thing on both sides. If you have a positive 1 and a positive 2s on both sides, it doesn't matter what s is. It's going to be an answer, right? I can plug in 0, I can plug in a million, I can plug in 1 fourth. If these two are the same expression, that means infinitely many. Now, if I have an equation, again, I have the same coefficient on both sides, but this time I have different constants, that's going to be no solution. Because when I subtract 3h from both sides, my h's are going to cross out, so I can't isolate it. I can't go to step 3. But that's not true. So that's no solution. So one solution, we either have one x or different x's on both sides. Infinitely many, I have the exact same thing on both sides. No solution, I have the same coefficient, different constants. Problem number 14 says, what's the constant rate of change? In other words, slope. So I take that table that they give me, and I just pick two points. I pick uh, the first two, and I go 
y minus y over x minus x. 14 take away 7 is 7. 1 take away nothing is 1. 7 over 1 is 7. The constant rate of change is 7. 15, which is steeper? The graph of the table. So we got two different, sometimes people think this is the same thing, but this is two different relationships. So I'm going to find the slope for the first one and then find the slope for the second one and just say which number is bigger because if it's a bigger number, it's a steeper slope. However, it's bigger absolute value. Right? So I can have a negative slope that's steeper than a positive slope, even though negative numbers are never bigger than positive numbers. So it's really the absolute value that we're looking at. Okay? So we're pretending negatives don't matter this time when we're deciding what's steeper. So for the first one, I look at the equation, and I can just do rise over run. I can see my slope is one-third, but some people get confused with that. So what we can do is for um, uh, the graph, another a shortcut is you see it's a line that goes to the origin, so it is proportional. So you can take one point. There's, see these coordinates? I can go over 3 and up 1. Over 3 and up 1. So those are the coordinates for the graph. If it's proportional, I can simply find the slope by putting y over x. Slope is 1 third. If I would have picked another point, those fractions would reduce to 1 third also. I just can't use the origin, okay? So, that's a slope of one-third. Now, the table, it says, uh, I can see that the table is proportional, too, because I know it's a line because they say it has slope, so it has to be a line, and I see that it goes to the origin. So I can do y minus y or x minus x, or I can simply pick one point. So I'll pick one point, 2 comma 1. 2 comma 1, again, I put y over x because it's proportional. There's a shortcut. That doesn't make sense. Just pick any two points from the graph, any two points from the table, and do what we always do, like we did here. It'll work, too. So I put y over x, I get a slope of 1 half. Now 1 half is more than 1 third, so this one's steeper because it's a bigger absolute value, and that's a steeper slope. Now if you're not sure, then you could divide these. You can convert these into decimals. You can divide it in and out and see what decimal is bigger. 16 says, which equation below is proportional? Now proportional means this. First of all, it has to be linear, right? You have to have y to the first, x to the first, or some letter to the first and some other letter to the first, and that number in front, that slope, should be in front of um, the x, okay? This is proportional. It matches that formula. This is not proportional. It's linear, right? j to the first, k to the first, but there's a plus 500, uh, 5 and 45 hundredths. This is not proportional because the k is on the bottom. That means negative exponent. That's not a line. And this one's not proportional even though it looks like it because if I were to divide both sides by j, I would get the j on the bottom. Again, not, uh, not linear. So the answer to this is uh, 16 is A. 17 says, so they give us a graph, and they say, what's the equation? Well, I see it's not proportional, so there's no shortcut, okay? However, they give us a graph that's very clear. I see the line hits the y-axis at 2, so my b is 2. I can take any two points and I rise one and run one. My slope is one. If that doesn't make sense to you, take the coordinates for two points and do y minus y over x minus x. You're going to get one either way. So my slope is one. My y-intercept is two. The equation, I put the slope in front of x. The y-intercept is a constant. Simplify. One times x is just x. There's my answer. 17, which ordered pairs are solutions to this equation? So we have the equation y equals 3 over 2x minus 1, and they gave us four ordered pairs. Now, if any of these ordered pairs are solutions to this, then when I plug them in, when I put the y where the y is and the x where the x is, I should have a true sentence. In other words, the same number on both sides. If it makes it true, it's a solution. So let's test it. So problem number one, can okay, you guys pause the video and check number one. And when you plug that in, you should have put the y, uh, the x here and the y here. So this is just what it should have looked like when you plugged it in. Now, subtraction means rule for subtraction. 3 over 2 divided by negative 2. Cross out your 1s. Negative times positive. This, this whole thing right here equals negative 3. And then notice I just copied everything else down. Using teams, negative 3 plus negative 1 is 4. That's true. So that ordered pair right there is a solution to the equation. So we're going to have to pick an answer that has 1 in it for sure. Now, when I test 2, the second point, um, 2 comma negative 1, the negative 1 is y, so it goes here. The 2 is x, so it goes here. Again, multiply these fractions, cross out your 1s. 3 halves times 2 is 3. 
use teams. Negative 1 does not equal 2, so don't pick any answer that chooses 2 as an option. Point 3 is that 0, negative 1. So negative 1 is the y, it goes here. 0 is the x, it goes here. 0 times anything is 0. And I see that 0 plus negative 1, this is true. Negative 1 does equal negative 1. So point 3 is a solution to that equation. Point 3 will be on the line of that equation. Point 4 is 4, 5. So x is 4, I put the x here. y is 5, it goes here. y equals mx plus b is what I'm using, right? So when I multiply these two, I make 4 into a fraction. I use my factor trees. I cross out my 1s. There's a 2 here and a 2 here. 3 times 2 is 6. 6 plus negative 1 is 5. That point is also on the line. So all the points that are solutions are 1, 3, and 4. Problem number 19. Problem number 19. We have two points. And they say write the equation. So we need two points, just like earlier. We need two things. We need uh, the slope and the y-intercept, right? So let's find the slope first. I subtract my y's, y minus y over x minus x, right? I did my rule for subtraction in teams, and I simplified. Negative 12 over negative 3 is 4. So no matter, uh, even if I switch these two, I should have got 4 when I'm done. Slope is 4. So now I have the slope, and I take one point. I have the slope, I found the slope, and I take one of these two points. It doesn't matter which one. In the end, you're going to get the same answer. So this is y, this is x, this is m. I put it in y equals mx plus b form. And this is how I get my b, my y-intercept. 4 times 1 is 4. Subtract 4 from both sides. I'm solving this equation, isolating the variable. b equals negative 1. So I know my slope. I know my y-intercept. I put the slope in front of x, the y-intercept by itself, plus negative 1 just means minus 1 when it's all said and done. Last problem. 20 says, what's the solution to this system? Well, we learned that one in class. That's just where the lines intersect. So I go over 1, up 1. My answer is 1, 1. That's the solution to the system. All right. I hope the video helped you guys out.